I want to thank everybody who's been with us all morning for really, really stimulating discussions. And now we're turning to the critical in issue of infrastructure, and particularly from the perspective of our uh, world-class, prestigious National Laboratory System in the Department of Energy. In the first uh, report of the Council's Commission on Innovation and Competitiveness Frontiers, we did talk about the importance of ensuring that our advanced facilities, our user facilities, are keeping pace with the modernization of other major institutions where we have to have the tools and the infrastructure to perform very important work. And of course, this is very, very true in the national laboratory complex that are performing major, major critical missions for the nation. So we have a great panel. Um, the Honorable Jill Hubri, who's the Undersecretary of Energy for Na Nuclear Security of the United States, Department of Energy, also had a very distinguished career in National Lab itself. Um, Dr. James Perry, the Director of Sandia National Laboratories, and Dr. Kim Budell, the Director of Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. We had a little picture last night with a few other ladies. I said, gee, this is a big group of women leaders in national security. So I think we need to say, we heard two of them today. <laughs> Anne and Barbara, and now as well. Um, very, very excitingly, the 2022 Chips Plus Science Act uh, that was signed into law provided hundreds of millions of dollars for authorizing, of course, funding for projects, but also the modernization of the United States National Laboratory. And this was a great recognition, as I said, of the pivotal importance of these facilities. So I want to start out um, and maybe turn to you, uh, Under Secretary. Uber, you had been um, a director, Sandia. You saw firsthand, you know, what was going on, what you needed. Um, Sandia's had a long history, of course, in microelectronics and other very important components that have gone into the uh, stockpile and refurbishment of our, of our nuclear capability. What's your perspective on the need for the investment and how to do this in a way that's going to take the laboratories into the future they need, but also, of course, being cognizant of costs and everything we have to deal with. Um, well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, we're kind of a tribe, so thanks for getting us together. Um, I, let me just say this. is a, it, um, Despite the fact that it seems like a lot of money has been put into science facilities, it doesn't feel that way to me. And I don't mean to be... Um, like depressing or, or down about this, but uh, you know, the I have the responsibility to make sure we not only uh, design and certify and assess um, our our nuclear deterrent and and have um, you know a strong nonproliferation program, uh, but uh, we we have to produce them, and uh, because we didn't manufacture or produce weapons for a very long period of time in the United States. Uh, and we were able to invest in science in that period, which is the good, the good news. But now we have to bring our manufacturing enterprise back up. And it turns out that when you stop working every day with nuclear materials or when you stop you know, manufacturing maybe anything, I think we're experiencing this in many ways across the United States, that's really hard to bring um, those capabilities back up. And so it's costing a lot of money to do that. And so it comes a little bit at the expense because we have no place else to take it from the science enterprise. Uh, so you know, we continue to advocate strongly for continued investment in science. And, and you know, frankly, we need more um, because we built these incredible facilities uh, across the enterprise that are really paying off. But they're now getting to be 20 years old or more. And we can't stay at the cutting edge without bringing those back up, uh, you know, introducing modern, more modern technologies. Uh, and so um, I applaud the administration's investment in, in science in general. Uh, but our enterprise um, the, in the Department of Energy National Defense Enterprise is really not seeing the kind of investment we actually need um, because of other priorities. And would you say that that's also 
across the entire complex impacting the energy laboratories as well. From our, I mean, our Oak Ridge has a defense component, but Oak Ridge and PNL and Brookhaven, et cetera. Absolutely, you know, every place we do this work. And I just also want to say the science, um, the, the Office of Science also has a similar, it's, it, it, this, it's, they have a similar problem of not having enough money to invest in science, but it comes from a different place. It comes from the, the, the um, acceleration and deployment of green energy technologies. And so the department has, again, a huge investment through IRA and Bill, but um, a lot of that goes to deployments, a lot of that goes for grants, uh, and, and it, in a similar way, the Office of Science is experiencing a shortfall in investments in our science facilities at all of our labs. And, and this is in spite now of the significant new resources that have been put in chips from science, or is that money still not beginning to flow into the system? We haven't seen a lot. I mean, um, Barbara talked about the, what they're doing for the CHIPS Act, and they got, uh, they got a fair bit of money. Uh, other people um, across the science enterprise got money, uh, uh, National Science Foundation um, and others. But and, and on, uh, honestly, we didn't, we didn't get a big windfall from that. Well, I know that council, in working with the leadership of, of Senator Schumer and Senator Todd, we did make a strong uh, statement and engagement that when you're talking about the overall innovation system of the country, the national labs have to be an integral part of that, and particularly now with the, the partnerships and the collaboration and convergence of many of these things. Um, Dr. Perry, at, at Sandia, you know, you, you have had a long mission for producing many of the components and things that uh, are been critical to national security but also a leader in additive manufacturing, doing some of the first fabrications and manufacturing of things that could go into the system and continue to do that. So how, how do you see Sandia's um, position and future now in terms of both facilities, but also continuing your leadership role in the whole um, stockpile stewardship and the other ancillary uh, initiatives? Let's see. Um for the audience's benefit, Sandia has, um, it's called the Mesa facility. Um, it is um, uh, both a fabrication and a foundry for microelectronics. Uh, I think it was finished about 25 years ago. So in the microelectronics industry, that's a very old facility. Um, but it serves us well for doing our, our nuclear weapons mission. It's the only place in the country that can produce trusted radiation hard microelectronics for the hostile environments that we're gonna encounter. So we still continue to stay at the cutting edge, uh, mainly in our hardware reverse engineering work in microelectronics. So the industry knows us well, so when the Chips and Science Act came out, we certainly are trying to partner in every place that we can, but frankly, there's no money in that appropriated, um, and even to, maybe to some extent authorized to recapitalize the Mesa facility. And so uh, we've got concepts and proposals into NMSA to do something called heterogeneous integration. So that's taking the very uh, newest microelectronics that industry can produce and then marrying that with our strategically rad hard microelectronics to provide new capabilities for new missions in the future. Well, the capability you have at Sandia in the hardened microelectronics, and you're the only place that fabricates, these have many other applications, including space and you know, do they, I mean, it seems to me that there should be a great interest in the commercial players and industry to want to partner and team with you in this arena. We, we do do different things. We, um, in the heterogeneous integration, we've already shown how to do this for focal plane arrays. But to be honest, uh, we're more than 10 generations behind in microelectronics. So there isn't a big calling for the chips that we make outside of the nuclear weapons mission. However, we do, we do use the facilities to produce ion traps, uh, we produce some of the, you know, the, the most uh, largest number of ion type captured uh, ion traps for quantum computing. We provide that to universities and other uh, federal government agencies. And how does our capability of this facility compare to our other partners in the world, whether it's the UK or other in uh, our allies group? And maybe even how does it compare vis-a-vis -vis China, if you know that? 
Um, I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know we probably can't go there. <laughs> Uh, but, specifically, but it's good that you know. <laughs> but, but specifically to the UK, uh, we actually produce those microelectronics for, for their, what's called arming and firing fusing systems for their nuclear weapons. Well, Dr. Budell, you and I had the um, dubious pleasure in March of sitting through a pl three hour plus congressional testimony before the House Science Committee with no break. And unfortunately or fortunately, you and I seem to get most of the questions. And for you, very excitingly, they were around the incredible technological scientific accomplishment of ignition at the National Ignition Facility. And I have to say, many, many years ago, when I was on a research advisory committee at Livermore in engineering, I was there when the first shovel went in. So to see this facility that's what, how many sizes of a football field? It's unbelievable, three. three. And what it's accomplished is, is something that's an achievement no one's reached. So we have to congratulate Livermore and all the scientists and also all the people from the United Brotherhood of Pipe Fitters and Workers, a member of the council that are there and you can see them in the facility. So congratulations. So I, I do want to share, have you share a little bit about what's accomplished at NIF and what it means. And there was some exciting discussion about laser fusion at COP28, too. <laughs> I can imagine. That's why I wasn't at COP28. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, for those who haven't been following the news on this, what happened on December 5th, 2022, was that we, for the first time anywhere, by any approach, achieved a fusion experiment that produced more fusion energy out than laser energy in to drive the experiment. So we produced a little over three megajoules of fusion energy for two megajoules of laser energy, uh, which is a really big advance for the field. So very exciting. And we've had three subsequent experiments that also exceeded that threshold. So it's, a, it's the real thing. We are really doing this. Um, what I think is really interesting about this, uh, of course, it's a great accomplishment for our laboratory and our researchers, but literally thousands of people over six decades contributed to this accomplishment. And a whole series of signature laser facilities have been built over those decades to bring us to this moment. So, you know, the first attempts, the first ideas around how to create controlled fusion in the laboratory um, really uh, were very immature in terms of the physics and their understanding of what it would take to achieve those conditions. The, the concept of the physics is actually quite simple. You just need to squeeze up some deuterium and tritium fuel and squeeze it together fast enough to a high enough temperature and density and hold it together long enough that the fusion reactions overtake the instinct of the plasma to blow apart. So 60 years later, we figured out how to do that. Um, but that took material science, engineering, uh, many breakthroughs. As you said, the facility is enormously large, the size of three football fields in extent and 10 stories tall at its tallest point. And we concentrate all of that laser energy into a target that's about a centimeter long. So that's one of the tricks in the system, is creating these incredibly high energy densities. And so without the ability to build this massively complex set of systems that work together in a very uh, uh, coupled way, we would not have the kind of breakthrough we had today. So when we you know, put the shovel in the ground to start the process of building the National Ignition Facility more than 20 years ago, uh, we had no idea, again, how complicated that process would be, how long it would take, or a good understanding of what the facility would be able to do. So this facility has, is revolutionizing how we think about fusion technology, uh, but it's also revolutionized how we think about materials in extreme environments. It's being used by the astrophysics community to understand the properties of giant planets and uh, the conditions at the center of the core of the Earth. It's teaching us things that we couldn't anticipate because when you conceive a facility, you just simply can't understand all the applications. So as we think about investments in research infrastructure, I think we often uh, forget this important lesson. When we make these large scale investments, they bear fruit that we do not anticipate. And so there's a lot of anxiety up front about the cost and the complexity and less discussion about, um, as Tom described it, the, you know, the risk of inaction is you don't get the benefits at the end of this process. Uh, the understanding that they require investment over time. 
So we are now, we've been operating the NIF for more than 10 years. We do more than 400 experiments a year. It needs some significant sustainment activities to be done. Many of the systems are quite old. Uh, remember, we were building the facility in 2005, so think about <laughs> you know, some of the computer systems that are probably in place in the facility that are controlling this incredible precision machine. Uh, many of the optics which have been through, you know, just these incredible duty cycles really need some time and attention. So starting uh, with these facility investments with the idea that we're making a commitment, not a commitment to build it, a commitment to build it, to operate it, to sustain it, and to advance the capability. And I think uh, we've had great discussions uh, within the national security community, which is what this facility was built for, about the importance of sustaining and advancing this facility, the role that it plays, but bringing the resources along to do that in this environment is incredibly challenging. I, I, I would also posit that it's an incredible example of what our country can do. We were talking earlier about think big and do big things, because in the early days, there were so many naysayers who said, oh, this will never happen, you know, we're going to pour all this money in. And every year, you know, through our yearly, there were people up on the hill saying, you know, don't fund NIF. And yet we had leaders in Congress from both parties who went the whole way to do this. Otherwise, we wouldn't have achieved it. And I think it's a lesson for everything in our innovation system. Um, and of course, one other thing is, you know, many of those optic engineers you attracted all came from Kodak which well, is interesting, when Kodak had its issues, you attracted them for the, the biggest project in the world that would use their talent. Well, there are two, two important things that you just mentioned. One is the process of building and sustaining support for NIF required things like building an industrial supply base that was centered in all 50 states. So everybody had a piece of this project. It required building partnerships, both domestically and internationally, with researchers uh, that were interested in the capabilities of the facility. It meant building partnerships with our uh, colleagues in the Congress to help them understand the challenges we would face, but the potential opportunities that this facility would beget. And building a pipeline of uh, technical talent at all levels, just as you said, and skilled crafts, and you know people who can um, you know, operate this facility, inventing new techniques and technologies for everything from crystal growth to target fab to um, optics conditioning uh, that have just had enormous spin outs of new technologies, new companies started, new economic development. Um, but that, you know, the idea that it takes a community, it takes a village is really, really important in sustaining that support. I, I want to come back to NIF and, and share just one story. I don't know if you know this. I think Pat Falcone and some others do, but um, in the beginning of the Obama administration, you know, the council was doing longstanding work on making the business case for high performance computing. And I had a call to come over to the White House to meet with Ron Bloom, you know, who was the manufacturing czar. And he was interested in the application of high performance computing. And I found it fascinating that he didn't know about the national labs had never had been to one. So I said, you know, it would be really interesting for you to go out to Lawrence Livermore. And he said, why would I do that? Why would I go out there? So somehow my brain worked, and I said, well, you should go out and see it because they're going to create a star on Earth. And he said to me, I have to go see that star. And he came out, <laughs> and he became a big fan for it. So, you know, the, the understanding of that in kind of a, a simple way is also important for people. And so I want to come back to that. But... James, you know, Sandia has really been, I think, a, a leader in working with the whole innovation ecosystem in New Mexico. I mean, Los Alamos, too, but you put together some of the first programs, both you and Jill, you know, to work for startups and building that. How, how do you think that's going um, in New Mexico? Because you are, you and Los Alamos, the, and the universities, but you're the major infrastructure to ena enable an innovation ecosystem in the state? Well, it's going really well. Um, we just got the latest economic analysis on Sandia's impact uh, to the country, not uh, just to New Mexico. From 2000 to 2020, analysis done by TechLink shows that Sandia had an economic impact of $140 billion. Wow. So if you take the amount of taxpayer dollars that came to Sandia over that time, it's more than a factor of three ORI. 
So we're pretty proud of that. So we have, like all the labs, we have a very aggressive tech transfer uh, organization. But from the state side, um, both Los Alamos, Tom and I, we get back about $3 million each to our laboratories for, uh, from gross receipts tax that we pay in. So it's not that great of a deal. We pay in $100 million, we get back three. But, okay. <laughs> but we use it really well. And, um, and so that, that, that allows entrepreneurs to come in and work with our scientists where the scientists are paid for their time to help advance what the entrepreneurs want to do. It also supports programs where CNDNs want to leave the laboratory, pursue their own small business, right, using licensed technology from Sandia. So it allows us to do some of that work with them. Um, and so those are two programs that have been very successful. You know, we have a tech park next to the laboratory, I think it's 400 acres, about that size. And it's, it's probably three quarters full. Uh, that was established about 20 years ago with a lot of these companies that continue to work with uh, Sandia. Joe, you are an in, a quasi-independent agency, NNSA, in the Department of Energy, but you work and collaborate with the entire department. Um, wh what do you think is the future, if you can look in the crystal ball, of the renaissance now of next generation nuclear energy? It was called for at COP28, I know there's a lot of work in small modular reactors. Um, could you give us some insight into where that's all going and how important it is for our energy transition? Yeah, I guess this whole nuclear energy thing is, has been one of the big surprises for me and my job uh, because it's actually taken, uh, it takes, it's, I've worked a lot with the department on trying to have a unified nuclear energy program. So the thing is, is that this administration um, is, is very keen um, to have a nuclear energy renaissance. Uh, we need it and an American uh, nuclear energy renaissance. Uh, so we have, um, in order to do that, uh, you know, and I, I'll just say one other thing. I've sort of come to talk about this as, uh, you know, nuclear energy is great for clean energy. We need it. But it does, and we can't deny it, represent a nonproliferation risk, a represent proliferation risk, rather, right? So it's the intersection, in, in a big way, it's the intersection of two existential threats. I mean, nuclear weapons, we've always thought about it as an existential threat, but now we have... Uh, the you know nuclear energy for climate change and the intersection which is an existential threat at, at climate change. So now we have nuclear trying to solve trying to be a part of both of these and they're kind of in conflict. Um, and so uh, so we have to do this very carefully. I mean, it is important that if there's a nuclear energy renaissance, we do things differently uh, in, the, in the US and with US technology. Um, everything from you know, creating uh, enriched uranium supply chain in the United States again, uh, which has, if you don't know, has largely been uh, a Russian supply chain. Um, and, but, but of all the nuclear, I, I think there's 38, if I remember the number right, nuclear power plants under construction, only four of those are not Russian or Chinese designed, right? So we've got our work in front of us. Um, you know, we've got to get back in the business. Small modular reactors is one way to, you know, potentially do that. Uh, we have to have supply chains. We have to, we ha so our line is, you know, you don't want to trust the, the, the Russian or the Chinese, to our like-minded countries, right? You don't want to trust uh, these, these plants being designed in those places and be dependent on those supply chains. That's a pretty strong, compelling case. But the Russian argument is we're the only country that has continuously built safe nuclear power for the last you know, 30 years. So why would you buy from anyone else, right? And, and so, you know, we have a lot of work to do um, to get, and on all of this has this proliferation footprint, the enrichment capabilities, the, uh, the safeguards, uh, the security of the plants, in addition to, of course, building safe, uh, safe plants. So uh, we're teaming very, very closely every day with our nuclear energy colleagues that reside in the Office of Science. 
um, and um, trying to figure out how to do this together with a compelling case to help U.S. industry, um, you know, dot, well, at, build new nuclear power here, build nuclear power around the world, and not have a proliferation risks associated with others taking over that, that whole space. And for our university colleagues in the room, we've also allowed over time the atrophy of actual nuclear engineering degrees and training. So that's another component of this yep. to address the workforce and skills. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we still have some great nuclear engineers <laughs> around, uh, but they're, um, I mean, we're lucky that it wasn't eliminated, but now we have to build it back. I mean, I've had a uh, conversation with, for example, the Japanese who, after Fukushima, said we're not going to do nuclear power anymore, <clears throat> and all the universities got rid of their nuclear engineering programs, right? And so now they want to be back uh, in the game, and they, you know, I've, the conversation has been, can the U.S. government help us, right? Or how can we have how can we use the fact that you haven't eliminated these programs? So it could be worse. Like, at least we maintain uh, okay. some programs here. But we really have to help our allies as well. Yeah. And of course, our, 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 our power producers as well, some of whom are operating. Um, Kim, Lawrence Livermore, if I'm correct, I think I'm correct, you were the ones who really developed L LIDAR. Is that correct? Or was it all the LIDAR sensing, or was it? Which lab did LIDAR? Lincoln. Lincoln. <laughs> Lincoln. But didn't you all use it in sure. the whole um, aftermath of 9-11? It was used for, in your role in, in, in looking. But it's an example of how it's just proliferated into unbelievable applications, including you know, finding in Egypt now massive numbers of sites that have never even been excavated through LIDAR. So I want to ask you, you know, in these developments of these capabilities for science and mission, you've had a pretty good track record of commercializing, creating the companies. And so maybe comment on any of that. I know we don't have too much time, but I want to put you on the spot. How long is it going to take to have commercial scale laser fusion in the United States? <laughs> right. It's not a panel with me if no one asks that question. So. <laughs> So here's what I think. We're at a very unique moment in time. There have been some very significant scientific and technical advances, and this is an opportunity we should not miss. The US has an enormous lead in this technology space, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done. <clears throat> so I personally think inertial fusion energy has some significant advantages, particularly as you think about operating a plant. The driver technology is separable from the target, so when you think about maintenance, and what actually gets irradiated when you have fusion uh, experiments going 10 times a second, not once a week, uh, it, it presents some opportunities. But that's gonna require new laser technologies, uh, blanket and wall materials for the chamber, uh, understanding of the tritium uh, cycle in one of these fusion plants, uh, new ways to build targets. We build these exquisite little works of art. Uh, that's not gonna scale for 10 times a second operation. So there's an enormous need for R&D in each of these areas. Uh, we have the fundamental physics building block, but you know, we need investment, we need the private sector to come in, we are not going to build a power plant. Um, we need uh, partners who are going to help us get to that stage. So as the industry is building, there's a huge amount of private sector investment. There is a huge amount of um, enthusiasm in this administration around fusion and in the Congress around fusion, and some early investments have been made. So we're on a path. But roughly speaking, time is money. So if you want fusion energy in 10 years, we need sort of a 10x scale up in the investment pretty quick because these are significant technology challenges, and the number of facilities where you can bring these ideas together is very small. So we need, we need to do that. My laser is a national security facility, and so our primary mission is to investigate the physics that helps us ensure the safety, security, and reliability of the nation's nuclear deterrent. And you know, we need investments that allow us to have capacity to work in areas like fusion energy. For the moment, the challenge, physics challenges are the same, so we're in a good spot. Well, so it's, one of, say, these, you know, it's one of these transitional, incredible capabilities yeah. that can change the world. And so I think we want our country 
yes. collectively yes. to understand that I and really marshal the investment. 20 years. 20 years, okay. So I'm going to take a few more minutes since I gave minutes up before. I'm going to take okay. my minutes back <laughs> and say that, that the Council on Competitiveness is very proud that, that many of the national laboratory directors serve as commissions on our national innovation commission and have, have made tremendous contributions to all of the, the pillars. Um, on this issue of ensuring that we have the state-of-the-art facilities, we have the collaboration with industry and universities, what can we, is there anything you can suggest, some of the thorny issues that we want to look at in the year ahead as we lead up to our report to the president? Um, Ann Newberger suggested a few things on standards and the telecom, and so I don't want to put you on the spot because we have time to do this, but just in the last, kind of a lightning rod, what, what are we missing, what should we do? And I'll, I'll start with, with you, Jill, if even if in your government leadership position you can recommend well, something we uh, need to really get into. Look, I, I just have to get money for the labs and stay out of the way. Like, that's my job. So, but, um, but honestly, we've got to do, um, we really do have to do AI um, in an in a orchestrated uh, government-wide way. Um, but we, and we have to continue um, <clears throat> to just get faster. I mean, I think everybody said this, so just foot stomping. We have to help, we have to lead the way in how AI and, and physical modeling and simulation can help us do things in a new way, um, invent new technologies that <clears throat> make us the best in manufacturing. I mean, we just, there's a lot our labs can do. Um, and you know, my job, like I said, is just get the money and get out of the way. Thank you. Very fast, because I'm getting the eye over there that they're not giving me my time back, but yeah. So I would just add to that, <clears throat> lowering the barriers to these new kinds of partnerships and creating a different kind of S&T ecosystem. AI is a good example. There's a huge amount of work in the private sector. We have longstanding relationships with those companies. We need to be working with them. You want someone in the public sphere being a part of this technology ecosystem and helping to ensure that there's always an eye on the risks and the unintended consequences component. And also, you know, bringing together academic partners, industry partners, and the labs in new ways that will help us go faster. And right now, there are, it's very hard to create those. For everyone who's written an MOU with us, I apologize. Um, you we'll know, work we on those that barriers. Mm -hmm. James. I'll just double down on lateral thinking. We have a history of basically saying we've got to build it at our lab and operate it. We're going to have to think. I just don't think there's going to be enough money to recapitalize everything that we need to recapitalize. We have to partner with industry, maybe they build it and we use it as a different model of thinking. Great. Well, I want to encourage everyone in the room who hasn't visited one of our national laboratories from university and industry to do it. They're, they're amazing places and the partnerships are very, very significant for our future and innovation leadership. So thank you all for what you do and your, your leadership and sometimes your jobs are not very easy. <laughs> <laughs>